do you remember when the Wii came out and everybody was like, wow, this is cool, and then years later everyone was like, yeah, it's not that cool, but either way, there were a lot of awesome games for the Wii. Of course, what's a Nintendo console without its flagship main series Mario title? A lot of people were kind of worried it was going to be some waggle fest of a game, you know, just for the sake of taking advantage of the Wii's motion controls. I remember when I first got my Wii, the first handful of games I owned for it, other than Wii Sports, were Super Paper Mario, Mario Party 8, and Sonic and the Secret Rings. None of these were games that let you use the nunchuck, and I had the thing lying around for months, and I just desperately wanted a game where I could use it. I just really wanted to play a game where I could move with a stick again, you know? How weird is it for a kid to go through something like that in the mid-2000s? Crazily enough, Mario Galaxy was the first game I owned for the Wii that actually used analog control via the nunchuck. It felt good to finally move a character with a stick again, as weird as that is, and I was glad to see that, despite having some motion control ideas thrown in, it was still a true Mario game following suit with the established formula. I got this game for Christmas when I was 13 years old. I got it twice actually. Once from Santa Claus and the second time also from Santa Claus, but Santa Claus was in different handwriting. Yeah, my parents screwed up that year, but I mean, it was more so out of tradition than anything at that point. I was 13, of course, I already knew, but uh, yeah, either way, it was still an awesome Christmas. I had Super Mario Galaxy to play, dude. I mainly grew up playing this one in middle school, and I haven't given it another full start-to-finish playthrough since high school, but uh, I remember it being pretty much a perfect video game, so I'm really interested in replaying it now because I know that's not going to be the case. Mario's the king, after all, so, you know, that means I gotta be real harsh with the criticism. I'm gonna to find stuff that I don't like about this game upon replaying it again. You know, a reviewer's gotta do what a reviewer's gotta do. So, uh, yeah, ten years later, let's see how Mario's big space adventure holds up. Similar to 64, Galaxy starts with a letter from Peach, this time inviting Mario to the Star Festival, an event that occurs once every hundred years. There's even this nice little backstory presented about the origins of the Power Stars and whatnot. Arriving at the festival, things immediately go wrong as Bowser crashes the party, steals Peach away, and knocks Mario into deep space. We wake up on some bum-ass little planet and these rabbits are like, hey, come frickin' catch us or whatever. So yeah, uh, 64 has the courtyard, sunshine, the airstrip, and Galaxy has this planet where you play catch with some rabbits. Uh, actually, that's a lot like the beginning of Mario 64 DS, but uh, yeah, anyway, yeah, you can uh, test out the moveset here and get used to the new gravity concept that this game has heavy use of. Sphere walking, as it's called, first introduced in that Mario 128 tech demo and finally implemented in a full game here. Basically, it's this neat little idea where Mario is affected by the gravity of small spherical planets and objects. It's really neat. Some areas that seem like a totally normal platform have an underside to them. The game often uses this to hide bonus areas that'll lead to one-ups and whatnot. Before we get too far into that, though, let's tackle Mario's moveset this time around. There's a couple of staples here, like the triple jump, long jump, backflip, side somersault, and wall kick. No dive this time, though, which is a little disappointing. Even when I was a kid, that was one of the first things I noticed about this game. No spin jump, either. That was another one of my favorites. Mario's got one brand new move, though, the spin. You can use it to knock out bad guys, interact with switches and screws and whatnot, and to get a little extra kick out of any jump. It's kind of similar to a double jump, but instead of straight up jumping again, it's more of a little hop to reorient yourself. Normally, I wouldn't think a Mario game needs something like this, but with the new dizzying gravity mechanics, it's definitely essential to making this game play well. Mario doesn't control quite as tightly as he did in Sunshine. You're not going to be executing side jumps from a standstill this time around. The controls are a little less snappy, and they did that because of all the sections that play with gravity. I mean, it felt great in Sunshine, but when you're upside down and on an angle, you're gonna want something that's a little more gradual feeling, and Galaxy makes that transition well. Anyway, uh, before long, we meet with Rosalina, a brand new character. She's this immortal space princess. I I'm assuming she's immortal because she explains that she does stuff every hundred years and, like, that ain't something a mortal man's gonna do. She explains that Bowser stole all of the power stars that were powering her ship, making the Koopa King just as much her problem as he is Mario's, and the two agree that in exchange for collecting the power Power stars to refuel her ship, Rosalina will fly Mario to the center of the universe where he can duel Bowser and rescue the princess. It's a pretty basic Mario plot, but there is some extra backstory on Rosalina's part you can access from the library. It's this Disney princess-ass story presented as a children's book. I 
I've never been a big fan of this, honestly. It just doesn't seem very Mario, you know? When I think of Mario, I think of wacky, cartoony plumber hijinks with uh, cute characters. I certainly don't think of some immortal space princess sci-fi sap story, you know? Rosalina Spaceship, also called the Comet Observatory, is this game's hub world. I never quite liked it as much as the castle or Delfino Plaza. There's just not a whole lot to do here. I mean, there's a hidden one up, sure, but nothing that really matters. It is satisfying to slowly see each part of it light up, though. Instead of having a unique entrance to every level, you'll now enter one of five domes that'll present you with a handful of stages you can select from. No longer are levels large open worlds with tons of stars to collect. They've all been replaced with more linear stages that only contain between one and three stars each. It does still follow that same mission-by-mission mission structure 64 and Sunshine did have, though. Completing a mission will get you a star, and collecting more and more stars will unlock more and more levels to play. So, do you remember that stupid mission structure from Mario Sunshine, the one where it's like, yeah, you need the first seven shine sprites of every level to beat the game, which means all the shine sprites are not of equal value like they were in 64? Completely gone. Thankfully, they went back to Mario 64 structure. All stars are once again of equal value. You don't like a mission? Skip it. Try something else. But that's not to say Galaxy structure also doesn't have its faults, but I'll get to that in due time. Additionally to controlling Mario, you've also got a cursor on screen. Using the Wii Remote to aim, you can drag the cursor over star bits to pick them up. These are practically a replacement for coins, though coins do still exist, but with much less importance. They're pretty much only there to refill your health. There's no longer any 100 coin stars present either. Pressing the B button while aiming will fire a star bit. Uh, you can do this to stun some enemies, shoot down projectiles, or hit something that'll make a coin pop out. So like, oh, I need some health, uh, coin, yeah, there we go. Uh, I never really found myself shooting them very often, but you will need them to unlock certain stages because there's hungry lumas in both the observatory and the stages themselves that you can feed a given amount of star bits to unlock a new level. Uh, from the observatory, doing this will unlock a one-off stage that contains a single star, but in a level, you'll open a new pathway that'll lead to an alternate star. There's typically one of these hidden stars in most of the main stages. There's usually the three main mission stars and one hidden one you can find by searching for an alternate path by either feeding a hungry Luma or by finding something like a pipe or a secret launch star. Now, like Mario Sunshine, the levels are all structured completely differently depending on which mission you've selected. So, to find the hidden star, you're gonna have to pick the right mission. Luckily though, the game actually tells you which one it's in this time. Actually, you know, I don't really know if you can even call them hidden stars because it's often pretty clear where an alternate path is, but I suppose with a more linear structure, it would be pretty frustrating to pass by it and get to the end of the level with no way to backtrack, where in a more open level, you can just hide it pretty much anywhere and have the whole thing available to explore. Wow, you know, actually now that I think about it that way, it doesn't really make as much sense to try to hide an extra star in a linear stage, as much as it does to hide an extra star in a big, open, and freely explorable stage. I feel the hidden stars work the best in stages like the Freeze Flame Galaxy and the Beach Bowl Galaxy, where the level's a small open area, like a 64 level. Then, instead of stopping on a linear path to take an obvious turn, it actually feels rewarding for finding something somewhat actually hidden. I know a lot of people much prefer the open design of 64 to the linear design that started with Galaxy, and I definitely do agree with that, I prefer that myself, but I got to give credit where credit is due. Galaxy has some incredible level design, toying with a lot of brilliant ideas. Many of these come in the shape of new power-ups, which are again, like in 64, brand new abilities you'll use to clear a stage, rather than a crutch to give you an easier time like it was in the 2D games. The first one is B-Mario, giving you the ability to fly for a short time. You'll use this one pretty frequently throughout the game. Uh, we've also got Boo-Mario, allowing you to float gracefully through the air and turn invisible to face through objects. I like Boo Mario a lot, and you literally only get to use it three times in the entire game, one of which is optional. I think they could have cranked more potential out of this one, but now, well. We've also got Spring Mario, which you can use to jump to great heights, uh, kind of like the rocket nozzle in Sunshine, except you'll have to bounce everywhere when you have it equipped, which I'm not really a big fan of. I find it more so a chore than anything to get Mario where I want him when I have this thing. This one's a classic, Fire Mario, throwing around some fireballs. Uh, you can use this one to knock out enemies, melt some snow, and to light up torches. The last 
one is easily my favorite though, Ice Mario. Water turns into ice upon contact, which means you can walk across lakes and wall jump up waterfalls. Oh, it's so cool. Unlike the other power-ups though, Fire and Ice Mario are both on a timer, which I'm not super fond of. I don't know if they did that to make it more challenging, but I just find it irritating when trying to get where I need to use it and it runs out so I have to run back and grab it again. And I know it's probably to make sure you don't bring the power-up outside of the intended area of use, but there's so many other ways of doing that. They did that with B Mario easily by either designing the entire level with him in mind or by using water to take the power-up away at a given location. There's one more power-up you get in the later half of the game, returning you to the original planet you woke up on. Flying Mario. As the name suggests, you can fly. It's practically the wing cap again, except you only get to use it once on this stage, which mind you isn't a very fun stage, and once more in the hub world. It's very underutilized, just two more levels with the thing and it would have been cool. But uh, yeah, it's just some straight up really solid platforming with a series of awesome new mechanics that keep things fresh and without having things feel that repetitive since it ditches the open worlds. One of my favorite stage gimmicks is what they call Matter Splatter. The stage will materialize depending on where these swaying lights are shining. And they only use this for one stage. They're so eager to try something awesome once and toss it out, ready for the next rad thing. This is part of what makes Galaxy such a strong title. It doesn't hang on to one idea for very long, giving the game a lot of variety with all of these neat platforming ideas. There are some areas that will have a brief element of collectathon, though, uh, trying to ring true to 64 in sunshine. You might have to scour a planet for five pieces of a launch star before you can advance. Some levels have you searching an open-ish world for five silver stars. Again, just like Mario 64 DS, huh? I'm thinking that game probably got made when Galaxy was in pre-production, so I guess they used some of Galaxy's ideas in 64 DS as well. Uh, th that's my guess. The silver star collecting often happens in the more open stages. Uh, sometimes, instead of being a series of mini planets, each with its own platforming challenge, it's just one big area. Not as big as in Sunshine or 64, but the concept is the same. I really like it when Galaxy goes for this kind of level design, but unfortunately, they're few and far in between. Most levels are a series of mini platforming challenges confined to a small planet. Uh, the older I get, the more I kind of don't really like the ones on tiny planets. When Mario's upside down and on an angle, I find it kind of disorienting and a little tough to get him to go where I want him to. I think the gravity mechanics work a lot better in 2D. In 3D, it creates some interesting stuff, but it can feel a little bit clunky sometimes. But in 2D, it's super cool, whether it's having areas shift in gravity when you reach them, or switches that completely change the way you play the level. It's awesome. I always found it interesting how the game sports these 2D sections as well. It reminds me of how modern Sonic games blend 2D and 3D. I always thought this worked really well, you know, as long as it doesn't overstay its welcome, but in Mario Galaxy, the 2D sections are sprinkled out just enough for them to add a nice bout of variety without getting annoying. If there's any one thing this game nails, though, it is the presentation. Uh, despite being in only 480p, this is a beautiful looking game. I think it was one of the first games I ever played that used a lot of bump mapping. The way textures reflect stuff looks amazing. Special effects like lava and fire, it all looks incredible. Well, that and Koji Kondo also kind of dropped one of the best soundtracks ever made for this one, that orchestral score. Holy crap, dude, it is killer. The sound design in general is absolutely fantastic. I mean, there's a reason you get chills when you launch through space. The music kicks in, the sound effects are just right, the camera work, it's all top notch, and it's easily what makes playing this game feel so amazing. <laughs> Honestly, uh, this is gonna sound a little weird, but it reminds me of the structure of the 2D Sonic games. You know, you're rewarded for finishing a platforming challenge with a burst of speed blasting through the stage. It's the same deal here, really. You finish a platforming challenge and you're rewarded with the amazing feeling of blasting through space onto the next area. Oh boy, I tell you, there's hardly anything more satisfying than flying out of a giant spaceship and having it explode behind you with this rhythm. Pshh! 
Boom, that is amazing, dude. But I particularly love how they brought back the penguins from Mario 64, man. I love these guys. They're way too adorable. They've even got some unique penguins too this time, like the Penguin Elder, which is a nice touch. Kind of fleshes the character out into more of a character type, like a race instead of just, you know, one kind of character. I like that a lot. We see a lot of conventional Mario enemies make a return. We've got Goombas, Bloopers, Dry Bones, Boos. Really nice to see them all with updated models since a lot of these guys were absent from Sunshine. Speaking of Mario Sunshine, the Cataquacks make a return and put to much better use this time too. Instead of just getting in your way, you'll have to deliberately use them to gain height where you need it. There's some brand new enemies too, like Octumbas. Oh, I really love these guys. On top of being absolutely adorable, there's a number of different types of them. Their design feels very at home with the Galaxy series and I think they're a great addition. That's not to say that all of the new characters are very memorable though. I can tell you right now, now, I certainly didn't remember Guppy the Shark or Camilla Koopa. I found these guys very forgettable. The boss fights are pretty forgettable in general, honestly. I don't know, I feel like they're all just way too easy. It's the exact same hit the blatant weak point three times in a row. It's just way too easy to figure out what to do, and it's even easier to execute it. Uh, previous games' bosses lacked the visual flair of Galaxy for sure, but I found them much more mechanically interesting and challenging, and I think that's a big thing Galaxy kind of suffers from is style over substance, at least with the boss fights. Another thing a lot of people don't like about this game are the motion control stages. There's a couple of levels that introduce a gimmick involving the Wii Remote. There's three of them. The first has you rolling on a ball by tilting the Wii Remote like a joystick. It's not difficult, but it's not really that fun. The second one is a bubble blowing thing. You aim the cursor at the screen and use it to blow the bubble Mario's in around in a 2D space. Uh, this one's a little more challenging, but it's, I don't know, it's still kind of dumb. The last one is easily the one I hate the most, uh, simultaneously because it's really annoying, but also because it's somewhat insulting personally. Uh, yeah, the Manta surfing. Okay, so you tilt the Wii Remote to steer, and yeah, I guess it works well enough, but obviously you just don't have the level of accuracy you would if you used a stick, and because of which, it's really easy to fall off the stage. It's just so much harder to get a feel for how much to rotate the remote for a turn than it is to tilt the stick for a turn. I mean, I know exactly at all times how much space is between nothing and all the way on a stick. I have a feel for every millimeter for in between without even thinking about it, but with a Wii Remote, I have no idea what level of turn is all the way and what level of turn is in between. How much is what? You know, you don't hit an edge, so there's no way of really getting a perfect feel for it. And the other reason I don't like it is because blooper surfing in Mario Sunshine kicked ass, dude. It was so much fun, but the... Yeah, they, they bring it back in this stupid and gimmicky way. Come on, guys. Can you please bring it back properly sometime? That would be rad. But you know, these are all just minor criticisms so far. If there's any one thing I would drastically change about Mario Galaxy, it would definitely be the prankster comments. And there's these things called prankster comments that have a chance of spawning in a previously played level. If you play it while the comment is in orbit, it'll make you replay the stage, but with an added gimmick. This could be doing it within an allotted time, uh, speeding up the enemy, and obstacles, doing it without getting hit, or racing Cosmic Mario for the star. The Cosmic Mario races are kind of cool, very similar to the ones against Il Plantissimo and Sunshine, but with this Shadow Mario looking dude, so cool. The others, however, range from frustrating to tedious. Uh, let's start with the frustrating. Okay, so the one hit runs. God, these suck. They're mainly on the boss fights, and as I've said before, the boss fights aren't difficult, but are they difficult to do in one run without making a single layer? Error? Well, anything is, so yes, of course, and it's dumb. I know multiple people who straight up never finished this game because they couldn't beat Boltergeist on one hit. It's just not fair at all, it's straight up artificial difficulty. And now for the tedious, the uh, speed run and enemy speed ups, they're hardly even changes at all. Changing the enemy speed, it barely affects the level in the slightest, and for the speed runs, they give you so much time, it just becomes another casual run of the levels. I mean, look at this! Does this look like a speed run to you? No, it's a leash stroll and I still had plenty time left over when I beat it. So what these comments really mean is just you gotta replay the stage, you know, just do it again. There's a lot of that in this game, do it again, and it quickly becomes kinda irritatingly repetitive. 
At one point, you rescue Luigi, and afterwards, he'll send you a letter being all like, Yo, bro, I found a star. Come and get it. And you know what that means? You know what that entails? It means going back to the level, walking up to Luigi, and getting the star. What is the point of this? I'm just doing the same thing again. I'm just going back into a level I've already completed, going up to a thing I've already gone up to, and just getting another star. I... There's a lot of stars that are like this, and it comes off to me as total filler. Like, they only had 80 to 90 stars in mind and thought, well, well, uh, the other games had 120, so... Hey, Johnny, can you just throw some filler in here to get that... Get one... Yeah, okay, thanks. A lot of these are from the purple coin comments, which are unlocked after you defeat Bowser, and in doing these, you'll have to pick up 100 purple coins, so it's kinda like the 100 coin stars in the previous two games. However, the way these missions are structured make them very different than the 100 coin stars in the previous two games. Now, firstly, some of them have, like, tons of purple coins in a small area, and you simply have to collect 100 of them within a time limit. These ones aren't as bad, but the others have only 100 purple coins in the level, and you have to find every single one, and that's already annoying, and secondly, you could collect 100 coins on the side in 64 and Sunshine while going for another mission, and lastly, they're often scattered out in such a linear and straightforward way that the mission is just downright boring to do. You know how many stars in the game are comet missions? 30. 30 stars you have to do these dumb comet missions to get. They're, they're certainly not the worst thing in the world, I guess, but I'd much rather them have something a lot more interesting here than a gimmick that makes you replay stages without much change or having a very mundane collectathon challenge. This entire endgame thing completely betrays the game's new non-repetitive structure. Ditching open world game design in favor of unique linear stages removes a level of repetition that 64 had, yeah, but why would you bother doing that if you're just gonna reintroduce repetition via mundane challenges. But uh, hey, at least once you have every star, you actually get a cool reward for once. Uh, after defeating the final boss and watching the credits again after every star is in your possession, you'll unlock Luigi as a playable character. You have to start a new game to play as him for some reason, but he does play a little differently. Luigi's got better jumping ability. I mean, he doesn't have any game-breakingly good jumps like in 64DS, but he jumps a tad higher and a tad longer, and as a trade-off, off, he can't breathe as long underwater, and he's a little more slippery to stop. This is kind of nice, you know, if you want to do a second playthrough of the game, you've got some extra abilities with some extra challenge. And that would be cool if that were it, but there is an extra thing you unlock if you collect all the stars all over again as Luigi, meaning if you want to 100% the game, you're gonna have to do all of that all over again as well. You unlock one final stage to get that fabled 121st star, and it's a uh, linear walk through the beginning area to get all the purple coins. Yeah, that's, that's it. Nothing really exciting about that at all. I mean, yeah, it's cool to throw us back to a starting area you can't normally go back to, like Sunshine did the same with the airstrip, but the thing about the airstrip is the airstrip was actually fun. You got to use the turbo nozzle a bunch, you know, get the eight red coins, smack around some strolling stews. It was a great time, dude. But here, you're just walking down a linear path doing something extremely mundane. It's just... It's just lame, dude. And to unlock it, you had to do everything twice in a game that already makes you do many things more than once. You have to watch the unskippable ending and credits four freaking times to get this area, since you have to beat Bowser once to unlock the purple coin missions as both Mario and Luigi, again to unlock Luigi, and again to unlock this stage. Why? Why do I have to beat Bowser four times? Why can't I just do it once? Well, speaking of the ending, I guess this is as good a time as ever to talk about it. Uh, yeah, spoilers as usual. We'll skip here if you don't want to, you know, whatever. The final battle with Bowser is really cool. Aesthetically, mechanically, it's not a very interesting fight. It looks and feels awesome because of the music and graphics and sound design, but again, it's style over substance and, you know. The ending itself, though, is something that never really sat well with me. It's always resonated with me really weirdly. Uh, so essentially, Bowser screws things up so much that he creates a black hole. The Lumas all jump in to save everyone, which creates a supernova, and then Rosalina appears and she's really big for some reason and explains that the universe collapsed 
and was recreated from scratch. Oh, listen to this cheesy malarkey. Can you hear the cries of the baby stars? Oh my god, can you please drop it with the sappy Disney stuff, Nintendo? This is a Mario game. I want to go wahoo and jump on Goombas. I don't want this, like, existential sci-fi immortal space princess universe philosophical baloney. Anyway, Mario wakes up and welcomes the new galaxy and blah 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 credits. This just seems too overzealous for a Mario game. You know, Mario plots have always been incredibly simple because Mario is a flat and simple character. You can describe the guy in three words. Yeah, wahoo. But uh, anyway, yeah, here we have this ending that just goes total sci-fi. Rebirth of the universe? I just don't really think that belongs in a Mario game, you know? But that aside, I'd say in conclusion, Mario Galaxy is still a pretty amazing game. The level designs there, the art and sound make you feel amazing, and it makes much better choices and means of game structure than Sunshine did. That that said, there are still things about this game I would change. I would definitely add more challenging boss fights, but it's the comets that make you do stuff over and over and the purple coin challenges I would remove in favor of actually new levels to get those remaining 30 stars instead. I would also remove those missions where you gotta go find Luigi in a level you already played and get a star, and I most certainly would make it so you don't have to replay the entire game over to get the final star. If you wanna have Luigi unlock him like halfway through the game and then just be able to switch between the two on the floor. Like, that's what they should have done. It's definitely not without its issues, but I think Galaxy achieves what it was going for much better than how uh, Sunshine achieves what it was going for. But that said, I think I still do kind of like Sunshine better, and that's simply because I enjoy what it's going for more than what Galaxy's going for, even if Galaxy does what it's going for better. Galaxy is a fantastic game, do not get me wrong, but it started this linear trend that Mario would follow for the next decade. We wouldn't have another Mario in the open world collector style until Mario Odyssey, and when I was younger, that kind of bummed me out. I personally prefer the collect-a-thon style games, that's just me, but Galaxy pretty much nails what a linear Mario game should be like, even if there are changes I would personally make. But of course, this wasn't Mario's final adventure in space. For the first time since the original Mario Bros. series, we had a direct sequel. Uh, we're gonna be talking about this one next time. From what I remember, it does things quite a bit better. It doesn't make you do things over and over again, but either way, before we get to that, you have to rewatch this whole video, except with uh, Brady, so we'll just get on that there. You remember when the Wii came out and everyone was like, wow, this is so cool! And then years later, everyone's like, ah, it isn't that cool. But either way, it still had a lot of awesome games. Kind of like Wario World. That was on the GameCube. You can still put it on it's the Wii. It's not on the Wii, it's on the GameCube. Well, guess what? I'm gonna put it on the Wii and it's gonna be it's, good. You can play it on the Wii, but it's not a Wii game. Wow. <laughs>